according to the Fed's own analysis of the Silicon Valley bank failure, you weakened the rules in multiple ways. You reduced capital requirements. You weakened liquidity risk management. You skipped out on using enhanced stress testing for banks with tens of billions of dollars in assets and more. And the result was that the second, third, and fourth largest bank <clears throat> failures in U.S. history, which together required $23 billion in bailout money. In fact, you now hold the record. In a single year, the FDIC has been forced to rescue more giant failed banks on your watch than any Fed chair in American history. So Welcome back to Real Estate Mindset. Today's video is going to be absolutely bonkers. Now, the data is in and it appears that Jerome Powell is no better than Ben Bernanke. After all, Jerome Powell does have the highest amount of bank failures on his watch. His track record isn't too good right now. And I'll argue another reason why it's not too good is he's allowing himself to fight himself. And we're going to go into all of that today, you guys, by digging into a Redfin article on the weekly housing market update. But today I'm going to be doing it a little bit differently. I'm really going to hone in on at what point exactly and why I believe that there's going to be a whiplash type price decline similar to what we had last year and really try to figure out when we expect the trends to reverse and the housing market crash to begin once again, because make no mistake, y'all, the housing market crash is knocking on your door. Unfortunately, it's going to hurt most any of the recent home buyers. And it's no mystery that right now is the absolute worst time in American history to purchase a home. And a question that I get a lot is, is what happened? We were experiencing massive price declines throughout the nation, not just Austin, Phoenix, Boise. It was throughout the nation. So what happened and what caused these trends to reverse outside of normal seasonality. I believe it was quantitative easing that happened. And you guys can see that in this chart right here around March. So the beginning of March, the Federal Reserve actually injected a tremendous amount of money back into the economy through the discount window, essentially bailing out the banks that had just had bank runs and gone out of business essentially. And by doing that, y'all, we basically started the clock over as far as quantitative easing all the way back to October of 2022. And if you look here, we're still not under where we were March 8th when we when they started quantitative easing once again. A New York Fed official mentioned is how do we get rid of the stigma of a bank going, um, you know, to the to the window. I mean, the, the, the thing is, rather than Fed being lender always of last resort, you know, if, if we have that liquidity window, it's available. Banks are reluctant to use it. But in an era where people can move capital so quickly, having that liquidity tool available and not taking a huge amount of hits for using it would seem to me to be something that would could at least take on this question of these internet driven runs, which so far I've not heard from anybody on either sides of the aisle, a really good suggestion, including I've thrown out a lot of suggestions that frankly, after upon reflection, I'm not sure make that much sense, but this liquidity tool of using the window, the Fed discount window, you know, is there a way to think about getting rid of the stigma? And maybe we as policymakers ought to make that point as well. But could you address that? Well, it's, so it's, it's critically important that people be able to use and willing to use the, the discount window and also the bank term funding facility, other facilities that we set up, and, and that they aren't marked down by the markets for for doing that. Now this primarily impacted banks in Silicon Valley. So what I want to do is I'm going to bring up San Jose. So we're going to take a look at the median sales price in San Jose and see if anything happened around March of this year. Okay, y'all. So do you see it? Do y'all see this now? I'm picking San Jose because San Jose is basically the capital of Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley took a massive hit as did tech companies. And you guys can see that there is a massive run up in prices starting at the beginning of March of 2023. And essentially look at this, you guys, it went straight up, plateaued a little bit and then went straight up once again. And again, what I'm saying is, is that started after quantitative easing. We can see that here in San Jose was the closest affected by the bailout. 
And y'all, what's really intriguing about this is when we throw 2022 overlay up here for median sales price, we basically know that San Jose peaked around May 15th of 2022 at $1.625 million. Now that dropped at the start of the year. You guys look right here to $1.26 million. That represents a loss or a decline of $359,000 at the start of the year or a whopping 22% off peak. So San Jose started off peak 22%. And look, it went sideways the entire time, including into the start of spring buying season. But as soon as that money touched those banks, look at this straight up. And not only did it go straight up and then plateaued here and then straight up here, it is now, San Jose is now showing a 2% increase in value year over year. So a lot of people are saying San Jose is back. It's never crashed. But the problem that people aren't paying attention to is it's still way far from peak. Even though it did rebound, it's still about $108,000 from peak. And that represents a 6.6% decline in median sales price. So odds are once the spring home buying season is over that the home price decline is going to accelerate once again in San Jose, depending on how much quantitative easing happens in the future. And again, you guys, the reality is, is the recent homeowners are about to wake up and some are already waking up to the fact that they have a three, four, five thousand dollar mortgage payment. And I understand normally real estate rebounds every 10 years years. But I want you guys to imagine what it would be like to be trapped in your house for 10 years with a mortgage payment that is almost, almost double to where it was three years ago. That's not a really cool thing to think about, is it? Now, the name of this Redfin article is Housing Market Update, the spring home buying season that never happened. It appears the housing market has rebounded because the median sales price is going up. But the reality is, is the median sales price is going up like it is because of the quantitative easing, but also partially because of the lack of inventory. Let's read this. Near 7% mortgage rates are preventing both would-be home buyers and would-be sellers from entering the market. This means right here, you guys, everyone was wrong. Whether you're bullish or bearish, this means basically everyone is wrong. The housing market right now is sideways. Now, I believe it's sideways because of what I just showed you because the Federal Reserve is propping up the housing market. And it's probably why we may not even enter recession until later on this year. But even though the spring buying season ended with a whimper, home builders are ending spring with a bang. And they're not talking about homes falling down because of the junk construction jobs they're doing. Construction or new single family homes is near its highest level in almost two decades, providing some hope for an uptick in inventory by next year. And you guys understand what I've been saying this whole time. There is hyper supply in new home building right now. In fact, new home building that's going on right now is exceeding the great financial collapse. This is so crazy. Even though rates are seven, seven and eight percent to some people, where's this credit tightening, right? Where's the credit tightening at? If, and again, and one of the reasons why these new home builders are doing well is because of the QE. If the Federal Reserve would not have done that discount window and allowed these lenders to trade in toxic assets, a lot of these developers and home builders would not have been able to get loans to finish their developments, power lines, workers, supplies, materials, salaries, things of that nature. I'm afraid part of what they're trying to do is fix a liquidity crisis at regional banks with a capital fix, which I don't think the two necessarily go hand in hand. In fact, it seems to me, while you've been trying to engineer a soft landing um, and, and not have, have taking a pause, and I'm not, certainly not critical of that. Um, I can't fathom why the Fed would want to raise capital requirements when we, we could be facing a, what's a credit crunch. And uh, I mean, does that make sense to you that in a, in a potential credit crunch with high cost somewhat by higher rates, obviously somewhat by design that um, does make sense to, to increase capital requirements for banks and individuals? So it's kind of like they shot themselves and all of us in the foot. As spring turns into summer, it's official. The traditional hot spring home buying season didn't come to fruition in 2023. Again, this is what I'm saying. No one was exactly right here. Usually what happens is something in between. This year, instead of the calendar determining the home buying season, the Federal Reserve is dictating when people buy and sell. And so far, the Fed actions are suggesting they Wait, thank you, Redfin, for acknowledging that first time that I remember that they're acknowledging that the Federal Reserve is telling people to 
wait. Let's take a look at this week's leading indicators. So the first thing is, is mortgage rates are up to 6.9%. That has come down. The tenure has been dropping, probably because there's something falling apart in the economy that we still don't know about, probably in commercial real estate. But what do I know? The next thing is, is mortgage applications. Again, this is why all of those bulls were wrong. Mortgage applications in the business overall is down massively. In fact, mortgage applications are down a staggering 32% year over year. However, look at this set of data. This is a crazy set of data. So even though all these other things are down year over year, what's up year over year is demand. They're saying demand is up 11% year over year. And what this is telling me guys is their calculation of demand is absolute trash. How could demand be 11% higher when everything else, including sales and mortgage applications is in the gutter? The reason that is, is they don't count demand as being a home sold. They're talking about like showings and interest and things of that nature. So this is showing that people to this, to me, this is showing that people are still interested in purchasing. They just can't purchase probably because of unaffordability. Now, online searches, you guys can see here is down 11% year over year. And also touring activity is down only 4% year over year. So again, even though that's only 4% down, mortgage applications down 32%. Do the math. People are still looking, but they are not buying. So take a look at this week over week. The median home sales price was 382,000. That's still down 1% from a year earlier. The smallest decline in more than three months. So even though that's down, it's still from the start of the year. Obviously that ballooned up and that's not what we wanted to see. And again, I'm going to go back to quantitative easing among a few other seasonal things. Now, obviously home prices are still down year over year drastically, and this is not from peak. This is year over year. Austin, once again, leading the way, followed by Las Vegas, Detroit, Los Angeles, Phoenix. What's interesting, you guys, is those Northern California cities that were having like leading the price crash are no longer even on that list. Do you guys think it's because they were pretty much all located in Silicon Valley? And do you think that because they're all located in Silicon Valley and that's where essentially the billions of dollars was injected? Do you guys think that that's why those metro areas are no longer on that list? Because when there's readily available money and liquidity, people are still going to buy, right? That's why we're doing quantitative tightening right now. So people stop buying. Now what we're going to do is visualize this data and I'm really going to dig into when I believe we're going to have that whiplash downward as far as price is going down, just like we had last year. We're going to start with median sales price and I'm going to show you a few things on what I think is going to happen and we'll really dig into this. But the first thing that I want to say, especially because I just talked to Jeff M, he's thinking about buying and my thing with Jeff is, is I was like, Jeff, please, if you're going to buy this year, for the reasons that you want to buy, at least wait till between December and February to purchase because generally when we're in normal seasonality trends, that is generally the best time to purchase, least amount of competition, highest days on the market, usually the best buyer incentives as well. And look at that. The case in point is here. If we And we're looking at four years of data and I'm going to circle, look at from January to February, house value either goes down or stays flat. Do y'all see that? In the last four years, house value started going up around the end of February. Do y'all see this? Okay. And that's why I'm trying to tell you guys, again, at the very least, play the seasonality. If you must buy right now, at least play that seasonality so you don't join the circus show of buying that's going on right now. But now let's talk about the whip lash. Now, I believe what's going to happen is between this pocket, which is basically the beginning of July. Oh my gosh, I can't draw. And the end of August is when we're going to see that whiplash downward. And I think it's going to be more powerful than normal seasonality because again, normal seasonality, we can't really look at this year or 2020 because it wasn't normal, right? It was an insane housing market. So it just went up, right? But it doesn't normally do that is my point. So again, I believe that's going to happen right in this pocket right here. And if we look at the CME group Fed watch tool, we can see that the, basically the market is anticipating a rate hike in the next meeting around July 26. So I believe it's possible that around July 26, we either see a continuation of a whiplash, possibly a plateau, or even the start of a downward decline. But 
I think definitely if we go to September, September 20th, as of right now, the market is not pricing in an additional rate hike. So if the Fed ends up hiking rates again, the federal funds rate in September, when the market is not anticipating it, that could be an additional catalyst for additional price decline. We moved very, very quickly when we had to move quickly. We've been slowing down since last December from 75 to 50 to 25 at every meeting. And now we're getting very close. We're at, at least close to where we think our destination is, we th where we think it is. And it only makes common sense to move at a, you know, at a careful pace. We don't want to do more than we have to, but we do think overwhelmingly people on the committee do think that there's more rate hikes coming. So the next rate hike will be around right here, followed by this potential rate hike right here. So we have this first rate hike here and then potentially a second rate hike right there. Not only do we have these rate hikes, we also have seasonality factors in play that are gonna bring prices down as well, such as kids going back to school. When the kids go back to school, ain't no one wanna buy no houses anymore. Generally, I'm just saying generally. Having said that, it's possible that we see something like this, a plateau, and then we got that rate hike, it starts going down like this, and then maybe we get a second rate hike and it goes down at an even faster trajectory. And I hope, I don't know if we will, but it would be, surely it would be nice to end the year under 2021 values. But, you know, here's the crazy thing, you guys. Again, if I'm right, okay, if I'm right, and we end up close, even if we're not under that red line or the blue line, if we end up close down here, what that means is, you're still stuck at where we were as far as home equity around, same as where we're at around June of 2021. So if I'm right, you didn't win. If you purchase from a price standpoint, if you purchase from June 2021 on, that means you're stuck. Now, the only way that people don't get hurt, okay, the only way that the term you could just refinance later, the only way that any of this works, y'all, is this is what would have to happen to price values. They would have to keep going up and stay sustained at that level. And just one more time, this is what I think is going to happen. We'll have that downward trend ending somewhere right here. Again, what this will mean is basically everyone from here up is completely wrecked. Do y'all see what I'm saying? It's, so from 2021, from beginning of 2021 on, everyone essentially has the same value, only the payment is different from about a thousand dollars. So in other words, if you bought in 2020, you are winning right now. And if you bought at the beginning of 2021, January and February, like I've been telling you, Jeff, January and February, you also won, but after that, game over as far as equity appreciation again depending on where we end this year now let's take a look at median asking price which is the leading indicator of sales price right you have to ask for something and then you get it now what's very interesting is median asking price has actually been plateaued from what would you say the beginning of may so we've actually had a plateau and a week over week decline so look at this guys so you you know it's not necessarily a trend yet but the trend has formed to where it has plateaued now hopefully this will continue going downward right that's what we want to see we want to see this going down but the really really interesting thing is is even though the median asking price is a leading indicator as far as sales price it has not affected the trajectory of median sales price so again going back to may you guys can see the plateau yet median sales price has gone up. Y'all, this is a big deal, okay? This is what I'm trying to warn people about. Like, th it's fun buying a house. There's like this honeymoon phase, right? And then it quickly turns from honeymoon to nightmare if you can't really afford your mortgage payment. And the reality is the people that are purchasing right now, even the well-qualified, because that's what it takes to buy a house right now, even the well-qualified people are pushing their loan limits to the absolute maximum, which means there is no meat on the bone. If anything happens financially in their life, they're dead in the water. So again, that's the people that are buying right now, not in 2020. In 2020, we're sitting on $100,000 in equity. We're sitting at two, three, 4% in interest rates. But right now is not 2020 or 2021. And we see that right here in these payments. Look at this guys. Th this is crazy. 
February of 2022, payments started really, really, really getting out of control. You guys can see if you purchased in 2020 and in 2021, from a housing payment standpoint, you're winning. Okay, you won from a housing payment stamp and even an equity standpoint, depending again on a few factors and whatnot. But from a housing payment standpoint, you really lost if you purchased February 2022 on you, my friends, and hopefully it's no one that's watching this are stuck to your mortgage payment with an inability to refinance into a lower payment or with an inability to sell, uh, unless you had a massive down payment, of course. But overall, overall though, average mortgage payment, and you guys think about this, again, think about how crazy this sounds. Average mortgage payment, $2,628, all right? Four years ago, or in 2020, okay, the same time, we were sitting at about $1,500 in mortgage payments, okay? Fifteen hundred dollars. Now, twenty twenty one, it did go up a lot as far as mortgage payment, but look at the gap right here. This is a huge gap right here from twenty twenty one to twenty twenty two, and that's why I'm saying, if you purchased right around here, you are not a winner as far as mortgage payments. Okay, here we have our pending sales. So pending sales is still down. It is down sixteen percent year over year, and this is what I'm saying. Ain't no one was exactly right. Bulls, bears about the housing market crash. Ain't no one was right. This market right now is all messed up. And not only is it all messed up, it's probably, again, the worst it's ever been in American history. And this is from an, an affordability and fundamental standpoint. And then when we throw in historically low inventory, that just makes things much worse. And then when we throw in a weak Federal Reserve, that makes it even more worse. At this point, quite frankly, I'm really worried that the housing market is gonna overheat and have a complete meltdown. And again, we see this very important data set here, which is new listings flat, okay, down 24%. This is not what we wanted to see. It's been flat, y'all, since about May. And this is when we anticipated that inventory would actually go up. But instead, unfortunately, of it going up, it just stayed plateaued pretty much the entire time. Um, pretty sad. We have new homes and the new home listings aren't a fair gauge of listings because these new home builders do not list all of their property. As far as total listings, we are actually down now year over year by 8.1%. But again, you guys, the pendulum swings the other way. Now we have our months of supply, very, very important data set. And I just want to remind you guys, once again, we almost exceeded pre-pandemic months of supply at the start of the year at over four months of supply. That's how we started the year. And look at this straight downward. Look at that, you guys. And again, it started around February, March, in between February and March. I'm trying to tell you guys, okay, when you inject $400 billion in liquidity back into the US economy, even if it's just in the banking sector, that money will spread into most sectors of the economy. But the, again, straight downward, the liquidity is there, everyone's happy. Now it has been plateaued since about May. So you can see that we did have an increase. I don't know if they're changing their data. You guys can see we had a small increase and then down and then flatlined and then a little bit of an increase again. So it seems like inventory is finally kind of teetering on, okay, it's about to go up again because we have no more home buyers that could even afford or even want to buy an overpriced house that they don't even love. Why don't they love it? They don't even have enough inventory options to find something that they love. People are settling right now on overpriced houses. It's another leading indicator of prices. So we have median asking price showing flatlined, yet median sales price is still the same trajectory. Again, very surprising, same thing with listings with price drops. Ever since around May-ish, just, just like median asking price, it's actually gone up. And when that goes up, generally the prices go down. But again, we haven't been seeing that. Why? Why have we not been seeing that when the other trends are showing us that it should happen? And again, these people, uh, and, and my heart goes out to you if you're one of them, and I don't, I don't mean any harm, but I do believe that these people are in for a very 
rude awakening. I know that because I've owned multiple houses, primary residence, and it always starts with that honeymoon phase. But again, it ends usually in regret or remorse. And we see that in the buyer remorse surveys all over the internet. There's something wrong with the housing market. Now, in conclusion, whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, I still believe that if we're going to purchase something, it's the biggest thing of our lives, biggest financial transaction. The number one thing is we should love it. Then number two, we should be able to comfortably afford it. But on top of that, we are just in a housing market right now that is just so broken. It's so toxic. It's so confusing. No one knows what's going to happen next. And for those reasons alone, I believe it's best we wait. And now here's the thing. If you're waiting, I'm not just saying wait and keep our heads in the sand. If we choose to wait, we should be working on our purchasing power and also looking for a great deal, right? Understanding our current market. How do you increase your purchasing power? credit, income, assets, improve all of those things. How do you become an expert in your local housing market? Well, either get your realtor license or have a realtor help you by doing market analysis on the cities and subdivisions of where you're interested in purchasing. Doing that y'all is only going to empower you. Now, here's the thing. If I'm wrong, you should be in a better situation. If I'm right, you will be in a better situation. Regardless, I hope you guys got some new value, insights, and perspective. And no matter what, if you're out there investing in real estate, you know I wish you luck because you will need it. And regardless, I do hope that you win.